Let's talk about visualization and mental rehearsal. I've been asked about this a lot, and I think it relates back to that kind of uh, matrix Hollywood idea that we can just be embedded with a skill. Although in this case, in fairness, visualization involves some work. Some people find it very hard to mentally visualize things. And some people find it very easy. There was great work that was done in the 1960s by Roger Shepard at Stanford and by others looking at people's ability to rotate three-dimensional objects in their mind. And some people are really good at this and some people are less good at this. And one can get better at it by repeating it. But the question we're going to deal with today is, does it help? Does it let you learn things faster? And indeed, the answer appears to be yes, it can. However, despite what you've heard, it is not as good. It is not a total replacement for physical performance itself. Okay, so I'm going to be really concrete about this. I hear all the time that just imagining contracting a muscle can lead to the same gains as actually contracting that muscle. Just imagining a skill can lead to the same increases in performance as actually executing that skill. And that's simply not the case. However, it can supplement or support physical training and skill learning in ways that are quite powerful. One of the more interesting studies on this was from Ranganathan et al. Forgive me for the pronunciation. Um, they looked at 30 subjects. They divide them into different groups. Um, they had one group perform essentially finger flexion. So it's actually just sort of the, imagine if you're just listening to this, the, you know, come here, uh, finger movement. Um, they also had uh, elbow flexion. So sort of bicep curl type movement. And they either had subjects do a actual physical movement against resistance or to imagine moving uh, their finger or their uh, wrist towards the shoulder, meaning at the bending at the elbow uh, towards actual resistance. Uh, just to make a long story short, what they found was that there were increases in this finger adduction strength, abduction, excuse me, strength of about 35% and the elbow flexion strength by about 13.5%, which are pretty impressive considering that it was just done mentally. So they had people imagine moving against a weight, uh, a very heavy weight, or uh, had imagined people moving their wrist towards their shoulder um, against a very heavy weight. But again, they weren't doing it. They were just imagining it. Other experiments looked at the brain and what was happening in the brain during this time. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a moment. But essentially what they found were improvements in strength of anywhere from 13.5 to 35%. However, the actual physical training group, the groups that actually moved their wrist or moved their finger against an actual physical weight had improvements of about 53%. So this repeats over and over throughout the literature. Mental rehearsal can cause increases in strength. It can create increases in skill acquisition and learning, but they are never as great if done alone as compared to the actual physical execution of those movements or the physical movement of those weights, which shouldn't come as so surprising. However, if we step back and we say, well, what is the source of this improvement? You might not care what the source is because I could tell you it's one brain area or another brain area. What, what difference would it make? But if, again, if you can understand mechanism a little bit, you're in a position to create newer and even better protocols. What mental rehearsal appears to do is engage the activity of those upper motor neurons that we talked about way back at the beginning of the episode. Remember, you have upper motor neurons that control deliberate action. You've got lower motor neurons that actually connect to the muscles and move those muscles and you have central pattern generators. Mental rehearsal, closing one's eyes typically and thinking about a particular sequence of movement and visualizing it in one's quote unquote mind, mind's eye creates activation of the upper motor neurons that's very similar, if not the same as the actual movement. And that makes sense because the, the upper motor neurons are all about the command for movement. They are not the ones that actually execute the movement, okay? Remember, upper motor neurons are the ones that generate the command for movement, not the actual movement. The ones that generate the actual movement are the lower motor neurons and the central pattern generators. So visualization is a powerful tool. How can you use uh, visualization? Well, in this study, they had people perform this uh, 15 minutes per day, five days a week for 12 weeks. So that's a lot of mental rehearsal. You know, it's not a ton of time each day, 15 minutes per day, but sitting down, closing your eyes and imagining going through a particular skill uh, practice or moving a weight. Um, maybe it's uh, playing keys on a piano, if that's uh, your thing, or, or strings on a guitar. For 15 minutes a day, five days per week for 12 weeks is considerable. I think most people, given the fact that the actual practice, the physical practice is going to lead to larger improvements, greater improvements than would the 
mental training would opt for the actual physical training. But of course, if you're on a plane and you don't have access to your guitar and you're certainly not going to be sprinting up and down the aisle, or you are very serious about your craft and you want to accelerate per- performance of your craft or strength increases or something of that sort, then augmenting or adding in the visualization training very likely will compound the effects of the actual physical training. There are not a lot of studies looking at how visualization on top of pure physical training can increase the rates of learning and consolidation of learning, et cetera. It's actually a hard study to do because it's hard to control for, because what would you do in its place? You would probably add actual physical training, and then that's always going to lead to greater effects. So the point is, if you want to use visualization training, great, but forget the idea that visualization training is as good as the actual behavior. You hear this all the time. People say, do you know that if you imagine an experience to your brain and to your body, it's exactly the same as the actual experience? Absolutely not. This is not the way the nervous system works. I'm sorry. I don't mean to burst anybody's bubble, but um, your bubble is made of myths. And the fact of the matter is that the brain, when it executes movement, is generating proprioceptive feedback. And that proprioceptive feedback is critically involved in generating our sense of the experience and in things like learning. So I don't say this um, because I don't like the idea that visualization couldn't work. In fact, visualization does work, but it doesn't work as well. It doesn't create the same milieu, the same chemical milieu, the same environment as actual physically engaging in the behavior, the skill, the resistance training, et cetera. And I'd be willing to wager that the same is true for experiences of all kinds. You know, uh, PTSD is this incredibly unfortunate circumstance in which there's a replay often of the traumatic event that feels very real. But that's not to say that the replay itself is the same as the actual event. And of course, PTSD needs to be dealt with um, with the utmost level of seriousness. It should be treated. Um, in fact, my lab works on these sorts of things. But my point about visualization and imagining something not being the same as the actual experience is grounded in this idea of proprioception and the fact that feedback to the cerebellum, the cerebellum talking to other areas of the brain are critically involved in communicating to the rest of our nervous system system that not just that we believe something is happening, but something is actually happening. And in the case of muscle loads, muscles actually be feeling tension, the actual feeling of tension in the muscle, the contracting of the muscle under that tension is part of the important adaptation process. In a future episode, we'll talk about hypertrophy and how that works at the level of upper motor neurons, lower motor neurons and muscle itself. But for now, just know that visualization can work. It doesn't work as well as real physical training and practice, but uh, these effects of you know 35% or 13.5% increases are pretty considerable. They're just not as great as the 53% increases that come from actual physical training.